We're back with Dan Milner as he gives five reasons for why you should keep your equipment simple. It, I, I think in general, the idea we had today was to talk about why it's important to keep everything simple, right? Yes. And you're like, oh, I'll just use a minimal amount. So I have, I have a couple of reasons why I think that's important. Number one, uh, it's less expensive. If you, if you just have, you know, my primary camera's four years old. I have one lens that's glued to it that I never take off. And if that's all I use and all I, and all I need, I don't need to spend money on anything else. And so what I spend money on is travel, books, education, journal supplies, art supplies, et cetera. I don't need to go blow thousands and thousands of dollars on new gear every year because why? When if I have something that works, and I mentioned this before, my two primary film cameras are 50 years old. You know, there's no firmware upgrades. There's no software <laughs> upgrades. Right. There's nothing. They work just like they did 50 years ago. And so... When I shoot film, which is rare these days, just for logistical reasons, but you know, I don't need anything else. And yes, um, and I'll mention here in a minute, I just got approval to buy a new camera. Blurb is going to uh, allow me to get a new camera that I'll mention in a second. But the X-T2 that I use now, it works fine. And I have this 50 millimeter, this Speedmaster fast 50 millimeter, which I really like. It's manual focus. And that's all I really need. You know, It's not like I have to and the last thing in the world, and I don't know if this has to do with getting Lyme disease and just being like cognitively challenged or lazy maybe, but I can't imagine getting op an opportunity to go in the field to work and spending a moment like fumbling around as to what gear I'm going to use. It just seems so counterintuitive because you have such limited, finite opportunity. That's if you right. Think about it. If you think about what good, like from in my case, documentary photography. You're, you're, you're looking for one once in a lifetime moments that are happening in the right light with the right timing with your composition and then they never exist ever again. The odds of getting that are so, so slim and so small that even if I'm in the field doing nothing but trying to make photographs, it is so hard and unlikely that I'm going to make something great that if I'm sitting there fumbling around wondering, hmm, you know, do I go to manual mode or do I use aperture? Pro I mean, it, it's gone. You're, you yes. don't have a chance. Point number two, uh, and this is, again, just another logistical thing. It's less to carry. I, I, I kid you not. Yeah. I'm 51. And right now, as we sit here, I have to the left of my spine, just below my neck, is a stabbing pain that I get about three times a year. And it came from carrying a camera bag for 25 years. Wow. And, you know, I was a newspaper photographer. I was a magazine person. So I had, you know, multiple cameras, two bodies, two lenses, strobe, you know, all this stuff. It screwed up my back. Carrying a simple, one simple, small thing, it, you're physically, and this is a point that I talk about all the time with people who are interested in documentary photography, and it gets overlooked and kind of, um, kind of poo-pooed, if you will, is your physical shape. Yeah. You know, if you, and I learned this way back in the day when I started assisting for other photographers, I had to be in shape. Yeah. You know, you had to literally be able to run and to move and be agile and have good cardio and everything else. And it doesn't, you know, historically, you look at documentary photographers and they're wearing a scarf and smoking a cigarette and they're drinking and all that stuff. And that's a fallacy, right? I mean, those people still exist. But for the most part, that that era is gone. Yeah. You know, you have to be you have to want it and you have to be physically ready. And so if your body is breaking down because you're carrying, you know, massive camera bags and massive amounts of equipment. And I've seen people do this traveling as well when I teach workshops. And, you know, people are out there and they're walking around with this stuff on them. And I'm like, you know, but it, it, when you're climbing the steps at Machu Picchu, that doesn't help. Like you want it to be fast and agile and in shape. So point number two is you have a lot less to carry. And trust and me, on, on that one, you think this is never going to happen. On that it's note too, happen. Dan, you know, if you visualize a photograph and maybe it's a quarter of a mile away, and you got to hustle over there. You're going to miss it if you're sh schlepping all this stuff around. I mean, you're just going to be slowed down. So, it's it's good to be lean and and agile, as you said. Uh, and point number three, and this is kind of kind of fun because 25 years ago I would not have said this. It would have been the opposite. But if you walk in and you roll up on a scene today and you're carrying a bunch of camera equipment, it's not good. Because people look at you and they go, uh-oh, there's a professional photographer here. Yeah. And all of the misconceptions about professional photography start coming in. Oh, you're getting rich off of us. Oh, you're going to get 
famous. Oh, you're going to do this and that. All the stuff that's completely bizarre and inaccurate. You don't want to look like a pro anymore. You know, 25 right. years ago when I started, it was beneficial to look like a pro because people had respect for it, especially like a journalist or a photojournalist. They would bend over backwards to help you. They would protect you. They would help you get access. They were excited that you were there because if you were a professional and you had a credential that said, I'm a professional photographer, it meant that you were vetted, that they could trust you, that you'd gone through training, that you'd been vetted because not everybody can get a press credential. These days, all of that is out the window. And yeah. so if you roll up looking like a pro carrying 15 pounds of equipment, people go, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, I don't want you here. And I've seen that happen a hundred times in the past couple of years. That's why it's very nice to just simplify, carry something small and simple and not, even if you are a professional, there's no benefit in rolling in looking like, you know, you're, you're armed to the teeth. So, so I've been to, you know, a jazz concert. As soon as I pulled out these big cameras, uh, uh-uh. I mean, I eventually ended up getting in, but if you're, if you're, if you're advertising, Hey, I'm a pro and I'm going to do something with these photographs, you end up with all sorts of uh, barriers in front of you that, that are just eliminated with a small, simple system. Point number four is something I have mentioned many, many, many times. It is painfully obvious. And that is the less you have, the more time you can think about your actual imagery. You know, again, I've seen millions, of, not millions, I've seen many, many people in the field staring at the back of their camera while the while life unfolds in front of them. And they're missing every single thing because they're looking, they're in the menus or they're switching lenses or they're going from body to body. The key is light timing and composition. That's all that matters is light timing and composition. And however you frame that is however you frame it. But the, to have simplify and just use one thing is essential because if you're trying to do two things at once, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example of this in a minute, but it's just, you have to think about what's going on in front of you, especially if you're what I call a reality based documentary photographer, which is, and these are, there are fewer and fewer of us roaming the earth uh, for a variety of reasons, but this is, I don't orchestrate things in the field. And I, uh, the only time I would orchestrate is if I'm hired to do a portrait or I see somebody that like I'm, I've been working with on and on and on. And I say to them, I need a really an official portrait of you. Then I will pose them. I'll find the light I want to work in, et cetera. But for the rest of the time in the field, I do not orchestrate. I don't hint for people to do things. I don't casually suggest they move to another location. You'll hear photographers all the time talk about this. And in reality, there's a whole kinds of all kinds of ways to skirt around the truth on this issue. And I've seen it by, with my own eyes in real time out in the field watching other photographers. But to me, if you're orchestrating an image, you are not, you're no longer a documentary photographer unless you're doing a portrait series you know, or an environmental portrait series. The second you start or orchestrating, you're a commercial photographer. And I've seen this over and over again. And so when you're a reality-based photographer and you are, you're going to win some battles and you're going to lose some. And you have to be comfortable with losing the battle, which means you have to be comfortable with missing things. And some people are and some people aren't. And so the ones who aren't will stage, recreate, fake, hint, organize. All kinds of famous pros have gotten into trouble over the years for doing this. You know, things that came out down the road. It was like, how did those things, how did those elements? So it's just about the light, the timing, and the, com and, and the composition is what you're after. And the less equipment that's in front of you to, to mangle those facts, is the better off you're going to be. And it's just more fun. The last point of minimizing the equipment, and this is potentially the most important thing, because at the end of the day, I don't care how many followers you have. I don't care how many people tell you you're great. You cannot hide from your negatives. You either have it or you don't. And so when you consolidate on a specific lens or two bodies and two lenses and you, you specifically consolidate, you will have a consistency to the work. And to do that, you have to eliminate distraction and eliminate all these other factors. And so if I'm shooting with a 20 to 35 and a 70 to 200 and an 85 and a fast 50, and maybe I've got a fish eye in there, all this stuff, what you get, what you end up with is a mess. It looks That's like a yard right. sale right? It's a yard sale of imagery. And then everyone goes, how am I going to make a book out of this? How am I going to make a net magazine essay? There's no consistency to the look. So it's really, that's probably the core argument for minimizing the equipment is that this is about our ultimate images. This isn't about a dance. This isn't a, the prom of photo equipment. 
and everybody dances around. Now, you, it, one of the interesting factors is if you cover a public event, especially today when there's like exponentially more photographers than ever before, you will see people who are what I would call legitimate photographers who are working that scene. And then you have people who show up to look at other people's equipment. And this has always happened. It's always been this way. It's happened since I started shooting in the late 80s. But there's a lot more of those people today. And the truth is, it doesn't matter. Like, uh, because the people who are legitimate at the end of the day are going to look into the magazines to see who got published and what those images were like. Um, the New Yorker ran an essay recently from the Black Lives Matters protests. And man, it was really solid. Like, I, have, I don't know what that guy used equipment wise or that person used. I don't care. I never once looked at that essay and said, gee, I wonder what 50 millimeter lens he was using. I don't care. I looked at that essay and said, first of all, why is a literary magazine running a 20 page double truck photo essay? What happened to all the news magazines? They're dead and gone. But I looked at that and I said, OK, great work, great placement, great design. That's a photo editor who actually knows what they're doing and a designer, you know, page layout person that knows what they're doing. But man, those images are powerful. That's the key. It has yeah. nothing to do with what, what gear he used. We hope that you enjoyed that video. If you did, please give it a like and leave a comment. We love to hear from you. If you want to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you can know when all of our future videos come out. And finally, be sure to get out there and capture your own images of life.